Well, welcome back to Doctor and Forensics for another episode of Point Counterpoint. It has been quite a while since we've done one of these. Life, as we all know it, is quite hectic on a personal level and on a global level. But that being said, we are able to get together on this podcast, Brother Kyle and I, and take a look back so we can help believers hopefully look forward through a biblical lens. Um, there's a lot to unpack today. So before I get started in terms of our topics and our focus, let me say hello to my friend, my brother in the Lord, Kyle Fosberg. Kyle, how are you doing? Hello, my friend. It's great to be back, back at it. <clears throat> I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, well, we, we've been we've been kind of thumbing around about what to do and kind of laying back. You know, sometimes um, the best thing you, you can do is do nothing. I think there's so many people out there that feel like they should weigh in on everything. And if you can't really weigh in to the point of this being beneficial, sometimes the best thing you can do is don't say anything. Um, we're not experts at everything, so sometimes we just sit back and watch and then cherry pick to see where we can be beneficial. So today, hopefully, Kyle, we, we can do that. And hopefully this can be kind of a springboard for us to kind of get back on a regular schedule. It's been challenging. I know you know what's going on here in Texas with me, and I know what's going on with you in Minnesota. So uh, we just count the privilege uh, for all those who do follow the, the channel and this particular element that you guys come along. And obviously, we always appreciate those who follow and the comments. Um, it's important. We just need to know what you think, and we want to know, more importantly, what you know that the Bible says about you know, these matters in the current events for the day. So today's a little bit of a grab bag, but not a grab bag, but more of a pointed conversation that we're titling Missed Opportunities. Um, Brother Kyle and I have been talking about how many missed opportunities that have gone by in the last six to eight, almost 12 weeks for pastors and teachers and people who call themselves Christians to speak biblical truth to four simple areas that were left wide open by our society by the events in the political realm, by stuff, everyday events, everyday situations, stuff that's in a news cycle that begs for somebody to speak the truth to. So I'm going to table all four of those right now. If we all remember, a few weeks back, we had the, um, the uh, Katanji Brown Jackson was nominated to the Supreme Court, and everybody was abuzz because she couldn't answer the question, what was a woman? That was a missed opportunity on the part of pastors. The second opportunity that was missed in the last four to 12 to eight weeks was the abortion conversation. As you all know, uh, some information was leaked and got out in the press, and all of a sudden we had this huge uproar. Well, I wasn't personally surprised about the uproar from those that are ungodly and for those who love death, but I was notably upset about the fact how it was so quiet from the pulpits of America, and in particular, those people who call themselves pastors that are female, because there's no such thing as a female pastor, but all those women in ministry that said nothing, notable silence. That's number two. The third issue that came up when no one spoke to, and it was a missed opportunity, was the kerfuffle that had to do with all the TG people and women's sports. So that kind of came and went to another missed opportunity from the pulpits of America to talk to the young people and their congregants about biblical sexuality and what God has to say about it. A huge missed opportunity. And then the fourth missed opportunity on the part of pastors, leaders, and ministries is the lie that is called the prosperity gospel in the light of our economic conditions and this massive inflationary crisis that we have going on. And the reason why I'm confronting it as a lie, because if you still believe that these prosperity preachers are looking out for you, then you are truly deceived because now the truth is coming out that the doctrine of tithing and giving love offerings and seat offering is not true because people have to make a choice now. Do I put gas in my car? Do I buy groceries? Or do I tithe? 
And I've never seen so many ministries that have been advertising to get people into the doors, Brother Kyle. So that's a lot. We may not get to it all, but those are four missed opportunities from my vantage point. And I'm curious to see how you feel about all four of those or one or two of those. And I'll just kind of yield to you. Well, I feel a part two coming for sure because, you know, I got all kinds of thoughts spinning in my head after you just rattle off that list. Uh, we didn't actually really do a formal pre-call, by the way, audience on this. So, uh, you know, um, <laughs> it's gonna be, this is going to be truly authentic and uh, spontaneous. But as far as – let me work backwards, uh, you know, from what you said about the, uh, the tithing and, you know, the current economic situation and people, you know, being stretched very thin. Okay, so what is the primary – job of a church. It would be to feed the flock, of course, spiritually, first and foremost, but also, you know, tending to their their life needs. So economic needs would be one. Okay, so right now, when people's uh, incomes are stretched thinner than maybe they ever have been uh, in recent memory, uh, at least in a general sense, on a broad scale, um, this would be the time that you would want to have your church helping the congregation with their economic needs. So instead of encouraging an already strapped congregation to donate more money to the church, the church should be the one, just generally speaking here, helping the congregation financially. And obviously we're not seeing that. Now the other thing, and this is a question, what does a church need money for? See, they don't tell you what they're going to do with your money. They don't even tell you why they need your money. They just tell you to give your money and that you're giving right. to the Lord's church, his purpose. But, um, but, you know, it's a sell job. You know, they don't really give you information, and they're certainly not going to give you uh, a spreadsheet uh, as far as, you know, a, a financial report <laughs> where your money goes. Um, so what does a church really need money for? Well, a lot of it is the property taxes. A lot of it is the maybe the heating bill, maybe the energy bill, air conditioning, uh, maybe all the staff, uh, the secretary, et cetera, on and on and on. Well, these are not things that should have been part of a church anyway. So yeah, you can have an edifice, but these large uh, edifices that are – constructed for the sole purpose of housing a congregation for an hour or two. That is just ridiculous. But these things have to be, have to be uh, uh, these bills have to be paid because these churches already have these edifices. They have the staff um, on and on. And when you think about it, Sean, in an inflationary environment where all of our bills are going up, energy, heating, rental, taxes, because if the, your property goes up in value, your taxes are going to go up in value. And your insurance is going to go up in value to cover the replacement costs of that property. So all these churches who have these big edifices, well, there's got to be insurance on that. And so they're going to need more money. And so now we are seeing a problem that was always a problem but is becoming more of a problem, more of a, a crisis actually, because these churches, in order to survive, they have to raise more money. Well, yeah. the money's not there. The money's not there because the congregation is strapped too. These are just yeah. regular folks. You know, these aren't millionaires who can afford to just write out hefty checks. So, mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, what a travesty. What an absolute joke it's really become. I mean, I'm just going to throw it back to you because I don't even want to touch on anything unless, until we, we fully really tackle this because uh, this is a yeah. huge, huge issue. I, so I, I, I agree. And I'm glad we're starting here, too. And I'll have to say, what makes it even more tragic is the Bible talks about a great falling away. And why do people fall away? Well, we all fall away, one, because we have a wicked heart and because we, we lust after things. We make things an idol in our life, money, jobs, people, situations, drugs, whatever. We make idols out of what goes on on the earth. But the falling away has to do Additionally, with people being completely disillusioned and disappointed because of the false message that they have heard. Think about it. Sunday in and Sunday out, people walk into a church with the expectation that I'm going to hear a message. So they get a 22-minute message. 
And then along the way, they get the, they get the opportunity to sow to give. But the sales job is that if you do this, God will do that, as if God is a quid pro quo God. So we are on the hook, and basically this is a, a math this is a math problem. Well, if I sow this, then I can expect God's going to give me. A, a, I'm going to increase at the interest rate of thirty, sixty, or one hundred fold. That's the dangers of the prosperity gospel because they've taken scriptures and they have isogeted it to make it mean what it does not mean. When Jesus talked about, you know, 36 and 100 fold, if you read the actual gospel of Mark chapter four, when he's talking about that parable, he's talking about spiritual things. He's he's not talking about money. And that's the dangerous of people repetitively hearing a false theology is now it becomes what they know to be Christianity. So guess what happens next? They walk in, they give, 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 give. Inflation goes up. Dad loses a job, mom loses a job, and guess who's the bad guy? God's the bad guy, because guess what? If you didn't get your blessing, you didn't give enough. If you didn't get that new raise, you're not praying enough. If you didn't get healed, you're not being committed enough. It's always the fault of the weak and the weak and the, the sick sheep. It's always their fault. Rather than having a healthy gospel that says, that in this life we will have trials, troubles, and tribulations, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. People have conflated the Bible as to say that every promise that God has ever made to everybody in the Bible is applicable to us, and that's not true. In the Bible, there's at least eight covenants, and if you go through each one of them today, you can only cherry pick specific items from each covenant that are actually applicable. But when God was talking to Moses, He was talking to Moses. When he was talking to Abraham, he was talking to Abraham. When he was talking to David, he made a covenant with David. As a Christian in 2022, I don't get to claim all the promises that God has delivered to David. That's for an example. But Sunday in and Sunday out, it's not about the gospel. It's about the gospel of me, myself, and I. Most pastors, 98% of them, are interested in shepherding the souls of the people. They're interested in money. And so there's that. I said it. It is what it is. People can argue with me. But isn't it interesting? The more the people give, the more nothing changes. Nothing changes, Brother Kyle, in their lives. They don't become better spiritually, nor do they actually improve physically and financially. That should tell you something. And with that, I yield back to you. Yeah, and the Bible says, you know, they go on deceiving and being deceived and so I think a lot of these so-called pastors in so-called Christian churches are actively deceiving themselves in the process of doing this now definitely some of them are just out there fleecing the flock I mean there's no question about it but you know which came first I mean there's a large percentage of both pastors and congregants who are deceiving themselves in the process of all this and in this particular example that we're giving here this is something that's going to end up biting them in the end because as you pointed out sean they're going to end up broke and poor and maybe some of the churches will too depending on you know how out of control prices get but this is going to be the 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 thing that makes them blame God, like you pointed out, because they were told a lie, so now they're angry. Now they didn't get their blessing. Now they have a reason based on their false theology, their false understanding of Christianity, to be mad at God. And so it's just, it's really tragic, but we do have to understand it as ultimately a willful deception on the part of the congregants of these churches because they have Bibles, I mean, yes. they're not going to be able to stand before God and say, well, I didn't understand. God, I didn't know. They had a Bible. They could have read it. Now, it's true. The pastor should be encouraging them to read, but they're not going to do that when it undermines their business. <laughs> they're right. not going to do that. And so you have to take it upon yourself at some point in your life to be like, you know, is this really true? If you're not going to do that, then, I mean, you know, th- there's just no hope for you. I mean, you, you have to do that at some point in life you have to be willing to ask the question. And some people 
learn at different times in their life, definitely based on, you know, their, their individual walk and their journey. But uh, there's just, there's not going to be any excuse and there's not going to be any uh, lack of accountability. Uh, you know, we need to, to ask the questions and we need to examine the scriptures. And, you know, I don't really know how the prosperity gospel uh, is, uh, how strong it is in other countries. You know, obviously it's a worldwide thing, but in America it's especially prevalent. It's a, especially a problem here. I think it's precisely because we have so much. We have so much money and it's such a strong media and we've been um, kind of lulled into that, and we think that you know we're we're the, uh, the the gleaming city on the hill, and that God has blessed us. And so it's that that sort of general deception in our mind that makes us susceptible to believing that blessing comes in the form of finances. And uh, yeah, you know, um, it's just it's it's altogether a, a real mess. And I think it's going this is going to be one of those things. This is just. I don't want to say it's like a prediction because we're not prophets, but I mean, we're just, we're projecting and we're making an educated, an educated projection that this is going to end in poverty for a lot of people. And like I said, maybe even the churches, maybe in the churches, because, you know, nothing, everything is so kind of uh, unpredictable these days. We really don't know what's going to happen. I mean, our, our government isn't looking out for us. They don't care about us. Um, Nobody seems to have the answer. Nobody can predict the future. Everything is really crazy. We don't know how it's going to end up. But I think it's going to hit the, the people, the hardworking people who have bought into that deception. It's going to hit them first, and then we'll see what else follows. Um, but I'll tell you right now, Sean, I won't shed a tear when all these fake churches fall. I'm not no, gonna... I won't either. No, I won't either. It, it, you know, when you think about it – they're actually part of the problem. I mean, a prosperity gospel is very Marxist at its nature. And, it, and the reason why I call it Marxist is because you have a person who's running a business who has no board or no type of uh, authority to answer to. There's no structure in terms of deacons and elders. So they, you know, the buck stops at their desk. So Sunday in and Sunday out, they ask you for money. And what's interesting about Marxism and socialism, everything's great until you run out of someone else's money. You know, they'll be in a crisis when the parishioners can't give. And since God never never tends to miss an opportunity for correction, I actually believe and think that correction is in these financial turbulent times. Because we made money our God. So how does God feel? Here we are, people who say we love God, but what we strive for is getting his stuff more than we get him. So why why should God care? I mean, if you're I, I gotta, being God, I gotta cut in. I gotta cut in. I gotta cut in. Jump I gotta in. Agree with you 100. percent I, I don't want to lose uh, my train of thought, but I want the churches to fall. I was a little bit hesitant yes. to say it because I wanted the timing to be right on that delivery. But hey, I, not only will I not shed a tear, I will be celebrating inside because I want these churches to fall. We don't long for death and destruction and doom. Absolutely not. Right. But what I do pray for, Sean, is that mm-hmm. whatever happens is going to be for the benefit of the faith. And so does that yes. mean that some people who are deceived have to feel pain? Maybe so. In that case, it's a positive thing. Just because it doesn't look pretty doesn't mean it's not spiritually a better thing for everybody overall. So I agree with you. I think the correction, spiritually speaking, is in these financially turbulent times. Yes, I agree. Sometimes you have to let it break. You know, God has a hands-off approach on most anything. The most supernatural thing that we actually get to do on a daily basis is actually pray, but most people don't value it, me included. If I did so, I I would pray more. Let's just be transparent here. So since the only supernatural thing we actually get to do is ask God, not demand and command and declare and decree, we can only petition the Lord. And since God knows everything about everything, why would God want to give a bunch of immature Christians money? He wouldn't. Exactly. He he wouldn't because we would just impale. And Paul talked about how we just in, James, excuse me, we impale ourselves with money. Yeah. Many have wandered away from the faith because of money. Jesus talked about money and hell so much. I mean, think about the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and says, "Hey, you know, I've kept all these things, you know, since my youth. You know, what else do I have to do?" And Jesus says, "Well, this one thing you have to sell all you have, give to the poor, and follow me." He loved his money and his wealth and his lifestyle so much that he said no to being a disciple 
and or potentially an apostle of Jesus Christ because of money. And then Jesus says to his disciples, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to be a part of the kingdom of God. That is yeah, stunning. What, what, what's so uh, poignant about what you just read there, Sean, is that, you know, this rich young ruler, he wasn't like a reprobate, you know, uh, backslidden individual. He was someone who kept the law, you know, and he, yes. he followed the commandments. And Jesus said, well, if you want to be perfect, go and do that. And then he turned his back and didn't want to. So money in and of itself is a real problem. It's just, it's just mm-hmm. always causes problems when it's not. See, it's meant to be money is a resource. It's not mm-hmm. something that we should hoard. It's a resource that, well, you need money, Sean, because you have to eat. Because we need yes. to be putting out too many Dr. and Forensics videos if you're dead from starvation. So you have to eat. <laughs> I have to eat. <laughs> We need money right. to facilitate the, the, mm-hmm. our lives. But that's it. It wasn't meant yeah. to be something that you hoard away and you covet. You know, that's, right. that's a sin. Covetousness is a sin. And money just makes it so easy to do that. And because we're such a money-obsessed country, and this is one of the mm-hmm. – I'm just going to go a curveball here, but this is kind of one of the, the pitfalls of capitalism in America is that it has turned us into a very gluttonous, you know, money-driven society. Uh, and, and that's just, you know, part of the sinful world that we live in. There's no perfect system of government except uh, theocracy, which is what we're going back to, by the way, different discussion. But <laughs> uh, there's no perfect form of man-made government because men are wicked. So we can't, we can't have a perfect system. So, you know, the capitalist American system really has corrupted us in that sense and that it's made us very focused on money, fixated on it. Um, it we may justify it. Uh, out of, uh, um, well, you know, we want to create jobs, right? We want to we right. build a nice business. We want to provide for families. But then we twist it into something that becomes covetousness in the process of that. And that's the deception. That's the deception. Right. That's us deceiving ourselves, taking root. So until we get to the point where we don't even realize that we value money more than God, that's why money is such a problem. That's why God can't give us money. Right there. Yes. <laughs> and that's a, simple, that's a simple answer that most believers can't handle. And when you think about the word capitalism, let me just say this. If you want to study history, most people won't. Capitalism, the word, it's just a cover story. It's a cover story over the tens and thousands of years for greed. When people who love and covet money in the world, they pursue these three, these three things, money, power, and sex. Believers should be pursuing love, joy, and peace. There's a complete dichotomy and a complete gulf that should separate what believers are pursuing and what the world pursues. But what's interesting, there's no distinguishing difference between us anymore. We have made the pursuit of money, you know, 12 steps of prosperity and, you know, how to pray down your blessings from God rather than respect what Paul was trying to communicate to us that God is preparing us for spiritual blessings, which are far more valuable and will last forever because our life is temporal. Our life is a vapor. Um, I'll turn 55 this year. I'm excited about turning 55 because I'm one more year closer to leaving. And I'm excited about leaving. I'm like, you know what? Better to be with the Lord than be here. But we have believers because they're not taught the gospel. They don't have an appreciation to understand when Paul says to be absent from the body, to be present in the Lord. They don't have any appreciation for the spiritual blessings that God has given us, and they don't want to cultivate that because they have been hijacked in their thinking and hijacked in their emotions. I really do think one of the ways that God is going to get some people's attention, not everybody's attention, is when you can't go and get those luxury items in Texas, it's the Bluebell ice cream. What happens when you can't afford Bluebell? See, unfortunately, you have to disrupt people's comfort to get their attention in the United States of America. We have people Absolutely. on our streets that are homeless that live better than two-thirds of the people in other countries, and you even have to disrupt them by doing what? Not giving people who are homeless money to get their attention that maybe they should be depending upon God. So we have a handout, so we have a handout mentality. Somewhere we've been sold a, a, a bill of goods that it's our job to rescue everybody who makes bad decisions with their finances or in their lives. But because we're always trying to make our country a soft place to land, no one suffers. 
And guess what? We should suffer from sin because it's the suffering of sin that leads us to repentance. But if everything's such a soft landing, whoever repents, nobody repents. And that's well, you know, one of the things that I see could t- potentially aid in the bet to help so many get back to Christ is when they don't have anything and they have no resources. Yeah, and, and I'm just going to pivot off something you said. Um, you know, capitalism and let's just say let's just say Marxism. Okay, well, we're not Marxist, Sean, and we're not a Marxist country, although there's people trying to turn it into one. Um, but the reality is, is that faith is with the individual. It has really nothing to do with the greater governmental system that we live under because there's a lot of people who are persecuted for their faith. And don't get me wrong, I'm glad I'm not one of them, but they're probably spiritually stronger as a result of that. And we've talked about this before on podcast, on at least one podcast. But So you tell me which is the godly system. I'm talking about from God's perspective, not us. You know, I'm not going to vote yes. for somebody that's going to persecute believers. But at the same time, I can separate and create the distinction between – how God sees something and how we vote as Americans. Mm-hmm. You know, he's looking at the spiritual well-being. He doesn't care about Fortune 500 companies. I mean, what That's built not. the wealth of a lot of these companies? Sin and corruption. You know, they talk about climbing the corporate ladder. You know, and you're going to be stepping on your your neighbor's fingers on the way up. That's what it is. But you know, we think about it in glorified terms. We glorify and romanticize certain ideas. Well, you know a rags to riches story and all the businesses he's creating. Yeah, I mean, obviously people want a good economy, but I don't want it at the expense of somebody's spiritual well-being. And the reality is, is that we have so much and we built a lot of that on the backs of other people. Let's just be honest. That's correct. We send, That's we correct. send them our paper money and they send us mm-hmm. their stuff. That's why things are cheap in America. Well, right now, Sean, and we've, we talked about this way long ago, um, but the China supply chain thing, well, that's shut down. China shut down, so you can take, you can kiss uh, Made in China goodbye. Man, I'm celebrating over here. I, I am, I am so happy. Yeah, this, like, this is like what we prayed for. You know, that's right. <laughs> so, well, to, to, to your me. point. And to your point, Kyle, why we should celebrate that? Because it was probably 18 months ago we we did. You know, God is not a globalist. Made in China. We talked about that. In fact, you brought up that topic. Go back, audience, and find one of our earlier Point Counterpoint podcasts. We talked about how dangerous it was to be yoked to, you know, the uh, country called China whose symbol is the dragon. That ought to tell you everything. And that how we blindly just consume everything that they send over here. They send us over, you know, cheap toothpicks and we buy it. But but we have to, to root out sin in America, you have to root out consumerism. And that is so painful for so many people. We are so used to going to our Walmart or Walgreens and things are on the shelves. Hey, I, I throw myself with it included, but I stand aside recognizing I could probably meet, I can probably miss a meal today and be okay, Kyle. Seriously. I, I could be okay. You know, I don't have to yeah. have three squares a day. It would be nice. But if I didn't have a robust lunch and I had a small salad or half of a sandwich, I have a few pounds that I probably can shed anyway. Most Americans do. But we don't even think, we're not even conservative to the point where we can stop and say, God has blessed us with so much that we can actually bow down and worship and say, hey, God, thank you. When do Americans truly say thank you for the opulent blessings that God has given us? So in the day of judgment, we stand. We all stand condemned because yep. when did I not bless you? Yeah, and Sean, you know, to that point, because I got another interjection here, is that the reason why a lot of people don't do it is because deep down we know that a lot of what we have isn't really of God. It's of us and it's of greed. So, yes, we wow. need to be thanking God for the blessings he does give us. But when you when you don't appreciate anything anymore, I mean, nobody goes to Target, buy some some cheap piece of junk made in China and has a godly appreciation of it. Because if you start examining it at that level, you start, it starts to expose the fraud of yourself and the system. And so people, people just consume almost compulsively as a way to mask that, that anemic mm-hmm. spiritual uh, you know, void, that, the spiritual void within them. And so to, to turn around and to thank God for some pe- cheap piece of junk that I shouldn't even have in the first place, it doesn't really make logical sense. 
So mm -hmm. unfortunately, the things that God does give us, like rain for our crops, a roof over our head, clothes on our back, we don't thank him for the good godly things either because we're not thinking about that anymore. We're thinking about what excess can we have. You know, a lot of people go around, they don't appreciate the clothes on their back. They don't appreciate the fact that they don't have to sleep in the street. They don't really even, that's not even in the front of their minds. You know, you might keep Absolutely them homeless on the street and you might be reminded of that, but it doesn't really stick with you. Like we have a, Sean, we have a month in America, and I, I think it's September, it's called Hunger Awareness Month. You, we should not need, I mean, how sad is that? We need a month to tell us that people are hungry. That's how separated we are from the idea of poverty in this country. And yes, there is a great exactly. you know, wealth disparity. There are more and more homeless people who don't need to be reminded of that because they live it every day. But mm -hmm. a lot of Americans don't even think about that. And oh no, there's a shortage of you know, something or other on the shelf. I'm not, I'm not trying to trivialize these problems, but the, the question, man, we're just going crazy on this call. The right. question is, and I'm going to throw something <laughs> to you. The question is, why should God fix any of our problems? Why should he bring swift justice to Hillary Clinton? Why? Why would it, if, if this is our judgment, isn't that kind of the whole point mm -hmm. of what we're seeing right now? Well, why should well, you, 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 you raise you raise some great right. points because we always want God to fix stuff. God says, enjoy your just desserts. And we don't yeah, like exactly. it. Okay, we would hope to have some justice in the geopolitical realm, but the fact that we don't get it is a part of our judgment. Yep. The men and women seek justice when they don't get it, it grieves us. It's a, part, it's a painful thing to see unrighteous, willfully unrighteous people do things that are so grievous and there is no justice. The Bible talks about that. Lord, my soul cries out every day at the, at the wicked things that people do, all, at the unrighteous. God talks about the unrighteous all the time. He just, you know, he laughs at them because they don't think that their, that their day is coming, but it's coming. But even righteous people lamented about unrighteousness, and God did never write the unrighteous. He let it continue. But that ought to tell you a little bit about the God we say we serve. And then we have the dichotomy and having these preachers that are Marxists out there brainwashing people, telling them that it's God's sole intent to bless them. Give me more, give me more, give me more, give me more. And that's contributing to the problem. They're a part of it. And, of course, lastly, let's be very candid here. I mean, you and I love history. As I have learned a little bit about it, everything's manufactured. The Great Depression was manufactured. The Civil War was manufactured. The situation we're going through in 2022, manufactured. These are all manufactured crises because guess what? I read my Bible, and the Bible says as long as the earth remains, there should be seed time and harvest, and the earth is going to produce. So guess what the earth is doing right now, Kyle? It's producing grapes. It's producing bananas. It's producing peanuts. It's producing plums and pears and apples and cherries. It's going to produce. That's not the problem. It's the distribution of it. I mean, seriously, we have baby formula problem? So you mean that the earth is not producing, so we can't make baby formula? That's not the problem. Either we hoard the ingredients or we don't produce it, but it's not like the earth is not producing. The earth is not going to be held guilty in the day of judgment of not doing its job. Yeah, and you know, the, the thing with all that, too, is I have more questions than I do answers. It's kind of like, yes. I think they're just fair questions. You know, I mean, I can sit back and kind of be confused by a lot of this stuff because what did people do before uh, mass distribution of baby formula? Like, that's an honest question. I don't know what they did. I'm, I'm asking, what did they do in 1850? Just an example. What did they did all? Did the children just die? Well, obviously not. So, I, these are just, this is my question. But, a great question. Uh, you know, why, why do we assume everything is just going to go on like normal? You know what a shortage of baby formula is, Sean? It's called pain. It's called yes. real pain. We just, we're mm -hmm. not used to that. So it's like, it's tragic. And yeah, mm -hmm. I want to see justice for the, the boneheads in office and all the people that brought about this problem. Yeah, absolutely I do. If I had the chance to vote for justice, I will vote for it every time. But at the same time, I can separate myself from how I vote versus my expectations for the future because I know that God is after people's hearts and souls. And so we are going to feel pain in this time and we have to take it upon ourselves 
to be more vigilant, more responsible, and more resourceful. That was the whole point of that Made in China thing way back last year. It feels like, yes. you know, uh, uh, time long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away at this point. It was been so long. <laughs> yeah, no. But there's, the whole point of that was it isn't like we're just giving bad news and then we're just saying, all right, see you later, folks. No, we're, right. we're giving that outlook, but the reality is, is that we shouldn't even have had this house of cards, you know, relying on big box stores to supply our needs. I mean, go, on, go back all the way to Genesis. I sound like a broken record with this, but God says from the sweat of thy face, nobody sweats anymore. I mean, we, we sit nope. in air-conditioned offices. You're probably in one right now. I mean, I'm yes, in one. Yes, I am. <laughs> it, you know, if, and, you know, and we we complain when the weather's not nice for for you know a, a stretch of one week. I, I mean, how how are you going to do in a situation where everything collapses? I mean, people are just going to be be fighting in the streets and hitting each other over the heads with baseball bats. But see, this is exposing the spiritual rot. The churches were not right. serving the congregations of the people. They weren't providing for the poor like they should. They were serving themselves. They were deceiving the masses. Um, the pagan society was oblivious. They were just going to do whatever they were going to do anyway. Um, yeah. So they look in at the church and say, well, I'm definitely not going to be part of that. And they're right. So, I mean, you can't even blame them. But that's, that's how sad the condition is. So you throw in a supply chain crisis, man, yeah. it, 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 strap in, buckle up, folks. Well, I'll tell you this. I have learned this in my life. You know, having lots of money makes, a, makes you more of who you are. Not having any money makes you more of who you are. Yep. More or less, it doesn't matter. So it goes back to developing biblical and godly character. And what's so painful to see, and I, I, I'm saying it's, it's painful to see, not like I'm not experiencing it, but it's painful to see that God is using the events and using the bad behavior from all of the players and people across the earth to show us exactly how wicked we really are. And the sad part is most people don't have the cognitive understanding that it's going to get worse because they've been lied to. They've been lied to. I mean, the world is going to wax worse and worse. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a revival and a great falling away. We did videos on that. Uh, Somebody's lying. and You you can't have it both ways. And we have an evangelical church that's self-deluded to the degree that Satan doesn't even need to come and lie to, a, to the evangelical church. They already bought the lie. He's moved on to something else. He's moved on yeah. to something else. It's, it's like we say in basketball. Mm-hmm. I used to play Hopia. basketball. Yeah, Hopia. It's like when I used to play basketball. We had that guy. He wasn't a good shot. We used to call him self-check. Oh, don't worry about him. Double up this guy, but don't, don't check that guy because he can't play. That's Christian. The Satan's not doubling up on us because he already has us. He already has the institutions that are called the so-called church in the Western world. He already has deceived them. He's, he's actually, he's actually in the pulpit. I mean, we don't understand just like we are seeing now in our geopolitical realm that infiltration from within happens in the church too. I mean, we haven't fought a physical war in a lot of years, but you don't have to destroy a country by fighting a war. I mean, there's a, you know, there's, there's, there's probably a gun behind every household in America. So it's kind of hard to win that war. But if you erode the culture, moral standards, biblical standards, and you embrace and push lawlessness like defunding police and undermining the family, guess what you have? You have chaos. And it's in the chaos, in my little opinion, that God does the separating from the sheep and the goat. Because either you're going to write your situation, repent, and try to go God's way, or you're going to get angry with him. The Bible talks in Revelation how God gives them space to repent. They don't. He brings tremendous, tragic plagues upon the earth, bowls and rafts and seals, and they still won't repent. That ought to tell you everything about a person's heart. And that's the whole point. You know, when we say Come, come out from among them, be separate. God, we can't be separate from this Babylonian financial system, but our heart doesn't have to love it. We just have to survive it. And that's a place that preachers and ministers should be preaching, especially when we're looking at economic times. They should be saying, be conservative in your decisions. Be conservative in your pursuits. Be conservative in the thing that you love and make God the central focus. Learn to live with less 
and then pursue God more because God's still a, God's still a miracle God. I mean, God can do anything he wants when he wants, but we won't even allow God to do anything miraculous because we're so busy trying to do it ourselves. We're so busy being deceived, pursuing the things of this world according to the systems of this world. We have no idea what God's system even looks like because we won't let it operate in our lives. And you know what it's really called? It's called faith. That's what faith is. Faith is not at, not trying to not trying to to acquire something. Faith is believing that God is going to do exactly what He said He's going to do. Nothing more and nothing less. And that's the gospel that has not been preached in this country for tens and tens of years, and now the cracks are showing. So I'll toss it back to you. Yeah, the cracks are showing, and everything is really just being exposed for what it is. And I think that you know, the most important thing right now in a turbulent time economically would be to be as resourceful and as conservative, conservative as you can with your money, the resources that you have. I mean, we know our money is losing value weekly, monthly. Uh, and so you're going to need more of it to to survive on. And these churches, they're not encouraging that. They're encouraging you to give more, and that's just exposing the false system because they need more. So churches yes. should need less. They should need less, or they should need more to turn around and help other people. You know, But they're yes. not doing that. So, so it's being exposed and, you know, man, we didn't even get to Katanji. We didn't even get to that whole thing. But, man, this has just been exceptional. That's okay. We well, it looks, look, looks like we got a little bit of a series. So, hey, you know how we do. We'll, we'll, we'll just crawl our way through this. But, I mean, these are missed. I mean, at the top, as I said, this is a missed opportunity. When you have a financial crisis in a country, this is an opportunity to help people ground themselves in true biblical faith and get them away from the distraction of the lie and the false expectations that they have. But the so-called yeah. notable mainstream pastors, the Joe Osteen's of the world, which is, he's not a Christian. Uh, T.D. Jakes, he's not a Christian. He may, have, he may have started well, but where he is today is nowhere near biblical Christianity. Um, Creflo Dollar, he's another pickpocket in the pulpit. Kenneth Copeland, he's in the demonic pickpocket in the pulpit. I mean, these are names and faces that we know, and the only person that's being enriched are them. And yet, in their congregations, we have individuals that are struggling with a mortgage payment, a rent payment, putting food on the table, and you have people that have been parishioners in their churches for years, but if you go to their door and ask for $500 in financial assistance because they are adherent to this Marxist system, they can't give money because they have a 5013 status, which disables them for being generous and doing what a church should do. That's why yeah, the they're so silent. The 5013 is an automatic death sentence. Death sentence. You inhibit yourself from being obedient to God's word. Yes. Helping the orphan and widows, Sean. Well, that one's off the table immediately. So yes. you can't even be a church. So they, they disqualify themselves right out of the gate. And then it's just, you know, what exactly is the horror show going to reveal? You know, how bad is it really going to get in these institutions? And it's getting pretty bad, but we know yes. it's not going to be good because it's not set up to be good. You know, there are... The Book ways. of Romans says, yeah, the Book of Romans yeah. says they exchange the truth of God for a lie. And that's what yep. these pastors have done. And what's the lie? The 501c3, it's a lie. They've exchanged the truth of talking about what a woman is, talking about what the Bible says about abortion and all of the sexual transgender issues. They don't speak to it. That means that they are complicit. Preachers, pastors, ministries, for the most part, they're Marxists. They're a part of they're, they're a They're a delusional bullhorn that has put people to sleep, and they're all yeah, they complicit. Change. They've changed the truth into a lie. I mean, what, what's an example of changing the truth into a lie? Well, transgenderism. You yes. take the truth that you're male or female, and you say, no, I'm going to change myself into a lie. So you're not changing yourself into your truth. You're changing yourself into a demonic lie because that's not actually who you are. You are exactly. either a male or you are a female, and if you're born a female, you'll always be a female. If you're born a male, you'll always be a male. 
So there are exactly. real life, literal uh, examples of that. Of course, you know, when we read that verse, we, we don't necessarily think of that first and foremost, but it's all part of the satanic scheme, you know, misrepresent everything, confuse people, change meanings and definitions of things. And this is all happening in tandem with all the other problems that we're seeing in the church and in our society. Um, and it's really, who man, I mean, money has so much power just all around because it has the power to keep us alive. It has the power to completely destroy us. I mean, look at people yes. who have gambling addictions, you know. Um, it has the power to reveal all the spiritual corruption in a country that is like America. Think about that. We have inflation, and all of a sudden you see the truth. It's like the, 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 the carpet is lifted, and you see all the cockroaches underneath. And this is, just, this is just by way of there being an economic crisis. I mean, it isn't like a specific thing happened. It's just that the system is crumbling, and so we see the truth. And it's really amazing. It's, it's you know, money finances and the gospel. It's just amazing to see how, how important this conversation is and how money has so much power and so much influence and sway in a society. I mean, it really is. It's just incredible. Um, and we see it written all throughout scripture, as you say. I mean, we know, Sean, quote one more scripture here. Um, it's not money that's the root of all evil. Some people misquote that Money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money. Yes, it is. Of all evil. It's coveting after. The sin is covetousness. You're coveting after something and making an idol of the money. Because if money was the root of all evil, then we shouldn't have it. It would be evil. Well, it's, it's not evil because we need it to survive. That's the whole point. It's a great tool, but it's so powerful that if you use it the wrong way, it can become equally detrimental. And that yes. is what we see in there. And it, and it leads to lawlessness and it leads to idolatry because the Apostle John said, John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, for us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And guess who he was talking to when he wrote that? Believers. He wasn't talking to unsaved people. He was talking to people who say they believe. We have to work diligent to keep the spirit of this age and the deceitfulness of wealth and wickedness, and the deceitfulness of wealth and riches from contaminating our heart. And I know it's hard. I'm not saying that I've got it mastered. I know no one does. But the point is, you have to understand where to put your effort. In economic times, this is a time where you actually – Go to the Lord and say, Father, what is it do I need to do to correct my viewpoint of what's going on in my life and my family and my finances and allow the Lord to bring correction? The one thing about God, he may not give you everything you want, but he will give you what you need. Our problem is God will give us what I need and we complain because we become a despicable, spoiled people. And guess what? When that happens, God, who is a father, will use the events on this earth to bring correction. And it is what it is, Brother Kyle. I don't have anything else. What do you have to say to close yeah. out? Well, I'll just say, you know, you said that, you know, you don't have it all together. I don't have it all together. And that's why we're doing these podcasts, because this podcast right here, I mean, this isn't some prescripted thing. I mean, we're doing this for ourselves, too. I mean, we're, we're yes. having a conversation right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is, this is great. This is helpful to us. And we're, you know, obviously – facilitating this conversation in a way that's going to be uh, disciplined and beneficial for the consumption of, you know, the people who want to, who want to, um, you know, learn from this and hopefully our audience can find it very beneficial as well. But, you know, this is, this is therapy. This is fellowship. I mean, this is for us just as much as it's for anybody else. And that's, and that's why we have such confidence in it because we're benefiting from, benefiting from it spiritually, and so we want to share that with everybody else who desires it so they can yes. benefit in the same way that we're benefiting. 
Um, yes. And, man, I mean, there's definitely more I can say, but I don't want to jump into anything else because, I mean, it's like we're at 55 minutes here. And, man, I mean, given how long this one was. <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're just at a stopping point, but we're not done with our series, Brother Kyle. Missed Opportunities Part 2, it's coming up. We've got three more topics that need to be deliberated here on our podcast, and we will do it. So, And with that, we are not done, so we'll just release everybody in the grace of God and the grace of our Lord. And so until next time, we want to thank everybody for listening to Dr. Forensics Point Counterpoint with Brother Kyle and I. God bless, and we'll talk to you soon.